As followers of this channel know, I am planning on heading back to Alaska for 2024, and I am in the process of putting together my routes and choosing locations to visit and explore. Being that I did a similar trip in 2017, I have a good idea what to expect, so I thought it might be a good idea to go through a few of the things we, that is my traveling companions and I, learned on the first trip, because they might be of help to you if you're thinking about attempting the same adventure in the future. I did a similar debrief video six years ago when I got back from Alaska the first time, so I'm going to add in a few things that I plan on changing during this second trip up to our 49th state. Now first, it's a long way up there. This seems pretty obvious, but it is a long way up there and back again. You should not take this lightly. Depending upon your time constraints, you may be required to ride some long days of 400 plus miles. And while this does not sound like much on an interstate, on narrow, often rough roads, this can mean 10 to 12 hour days in the saddle. So what I'm going to do for this trip is that I'm going to slow down and try to travel in the neighborhood of 300 miles a day. This will make my trip longer, but I think more enjoyable. So number two, when is the best time to go? Now, of course, I've only been up there once, and we found that July was a great time to go through Canada and into Alaska. July to August would be what I would suggest would give you the best weather, at least in my opinion. Now, this time I'm again planning to go during July and August. Now, number three, there will be wild swings in weather. Even in July and August, we saw nighttime temps that dipped down in the 30s and 40s and daytime temps that were between 50 and 80. While we only had a few days that were complete washouts, it rained almost every day at least for a few minutes. So you need to be prepared with the proper gear. Now for this trip, I am going to do some gear upgrades. So as we get closer, I will cover those. So number four, most of the roads are in good shape. Now, while that's true, the last time we went up there, there were some sections with frost heaves and potholes. And I'm sure this varies year to year. But overall, the roads are paved and you can take just about any bike you want up there. Number five, there will be lots of bugs. Now, we did not have a big problem with mosquitoes in 2017, but I'm sure this varies year to year. But our windscreens and visors were constantly covered with bugs. So you're going to need something to clean them off, some cleaner and some microfiber cloths. Number six, there will be a lot of construction. Summertime is construction time, and there will be a lot of it. The roads through Canada are chip seal, and some of the roads may be freshly graveled. Typically, this is not an issue, but depending upon your bike and tire choice, it may mean slowing down a little. There will also be sections of the Alcan Highway that have been stripped down to dirt. We ran into this several times, one of those sections being about 10 miles or more in length. Again, this is no problem if you are prepared. Now, there is a bit of etiquette at the construction sites. In Canada, they typically use escort vehicles, so you may be waiting for several minutes or even longer. Some will tell you that it is okay for bikes to move up to the front of the line, but we did not find that to be the case. At one construction site, we were waved around by an RV driver, but when we got to the front, the flag person, in this case a woman, yelled at us for creating an unsafe situation. She even threatened to call the Mounties. Now, we were a bit shocked about all this, but we learned that you never move up unless the flagger says it's okay to do so. So number seven, fuel is not as hard to find as most make it out to be. Finding gas was not that hard, but if you want to make sure, then you must fill up whenever it's available. For the most part, we filled up in the morning and then again at any stop where it was available. Generally, this was about every 100 miles or so. The furthest we had to travel without fuel was about 180 miles again or so. Before you head up, make sure you look at a map. Again, I use Google Maps and see if you can locate gas stations along your route. 
If there are going to be sections over your tank capacity, well, you're going to need to carry some extra fuel with you. Just be smart. Also, you are not always going to be able to find 91 octane fuel. So I carried some octane booster for those times when we were forced to use 87 or even 85 octane. Number eight, it was not always easy to find food. Now, while gas, as it turned out, was not a big deal, sometimes finding food was. There were times when the only thing to eat was found at a local gas station. Now, you can do some pre-planning and pack some snacks for those days where you think food will be scarce. So number nine, let's talk about lodging. Some people like to camp and others do not. Camping means carrying more gear as well as setting up and tearing down every day. It's all up to you and just depends upon what you enjoy. For this trip, I really do not want to camp. I would prefer to find motels or other places to stay along the way, which means a bit more pre-planning, finding locations with accommodations, and maybe pre-booking as many locations are limited in availability. For this second trip, as I said, I'm going to try not to camp. Some have suggested bringing camping gear just in case, and I may have to think about that. I'm really not thrilled about carrying gear all the way up to Alaska for, well, 60 days and never using it. So number 10, the sun does not go down. So speaking of camping, it is essential that you are prepared for the fact that the sun will not set as you go further north. This means going to bed at 9 p.m. in full sunlight, so I strongly suggest bringing a pair of blackout eye covers or a sleep mask. This turned out to be a big issue for me on the last trip, making it very difficult to get quality rest. So number 11, bears. Yep, riding to Alaska means riding through bear country. We saw plenty of black bear along the way, as well as a few grizzlies, but we never saw them while camping. We stayed in established campgrounds with bear deterrent programs. They had either fences or rangers who would patrol the campground making noise. So it is essential that you follow the proper anti-bear policies, however, and you keep food and good smelling stuff away from your campsite. Now, dispose of all foodstuffs in the bear-proof bins provided, and you might want to use a bear bag or vault if you are wild camping. But in established campgrounds, there are limited places where you can use those because there are people all around you and no real place to hang your bag that is away from those people. Now, if you see bears on the road, well, keep your distance. And if you see cubs, remember that the mother probably isn't too far away. So number 12, other animals. Now you will most likely, but it is not guaranteed, see a lot of animals on your trip to Alaska. Bear, deer, moose, elk, sheep, fox, and bison are all commonly seen. Canada does a good job of keeping the vegetation back away from the road, but you still need to be watchful for animal life crossing the road. We saw quite a bit of it. Number 13, tires. Now, most of the Alcan and other highways are paved, but as I mentioned, there are sections of gravel and even dirt. On an adventure bike, I would suggest either an 80-20 or even a 50-50 tire. We had 50-50s on the last trip, and they worked out great. On a big touring bike, your options will be limited, so just get something that does well in the rain, and know you may have to slow down in some areas. Now, last time, I used the Metis E07 Dakar, and this time I'm looking at the Dunlop Trailmac Mission. I have a set on my bike now, trying them out to see how they'll work for the trip. So number 14, metal bridges. I have seen some people get all freaked out over the metal bridges, and yes, they can be slippery, or at least feel that way. On adventure bikes, I suggest standing up and letting the bike do its thing. It's really no big deal. On a touring bike, again, you just have to let the bike do what it is going to do and not get freaked out. Stay loose and you'll be fine. So number 15, what is the best kind of bike? Now for me, the best kind of bike is an adventure bike, but you can do the ride up to Alaska on whatever you currently own. The most common bike we saw on this last trip 
were Harley Davidsons. The BMW GS was also a very popular choice. But there are riders on just about anything you can think of and even some pulling trailers. Now, there are places like the Top of the World Highway, the Dalton, and the Dempster that I would not suggest a big touring bike. But I know people who have done it, so just know your skill level and run what you brung. Now, for me, the last time I was on a Yamaha Super Tenere, but this time I will be taking my Triumph Tiger 1200 GT Explorer. So I think that's about it. I have covered most of the things we learned on our last trip and a few things I'm planning to change this time around. As we get closer, I will cover packing, gear changes, and of course, my final plans. All right, guys, see you next time and ride safe.